Hello everybody, I'm Peter Hudson, I'm the Director of the Centre for Palliative Care. I'd like you to welcome you all to our annual lecture for 2020. I'm absolutely delighted by the interest in neuropalliative care. I've just found out that we've got um, more than 600 people registered for this webinar, which is absolutely fantastic. So thank you very much for being part of this. We've got two guest speakers today, Dr. Benzie Kluger from the USA and Dr. Susan Mathers from Melbourne. And we're going to have an opportunity at the end of their presentations for questions and responses. So I would encourage you to submit your questions uh, via the, the live chat uh, question and answer tab. And please do so throughout their presentation. So at the end, we've got an opportunity to have a pool of questions uh, to direct to Benzi and to Susan. And this is a great opportunity. We've got two experts um, in this particular topic. So please don't be shy. We would welcome your questions and comments. Uh, so thank you very much in advance for that. Before I introduce Benzi, in the spirit of reconciliation, the Centre for Palliative Care acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and the connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So Dr. Benzie Kluger um, is a doctor and he uh, completed his undergraduate degree in psychology, then medical school and neurology residency at the University of Colorado. From 2008 to 2019, he was at the University of Colorado School of Medicine where he rose to the rank of professor and was the founding director of several innovative neuropalliative care programs. He's now a professor of neurology and medicine at the University of Rochester Medical Center, New York and the founding director of their Neuro Palliative Care Division and their Palliative Care Research Centre. Benzi is also the founding president of the International Neuro Palliative Care Society. So a very warm welcome to you, Benzi, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Peter. And uh, thank you all for uh, spending uh, an hour with me hearing about a topic that I'm uh, very passionate about. Um, so how do we improve palliative care for people with neurologic illness? I, I think this is actually a very timely topic. Our International Neuro Palliative Care Society website should be coming off the ground. We're going to have our first uh, annual meeting next year. Uh, this is a topic that actually Peter uh, was one of the people who inspired me to get into the field. He was writing about palliative care for Parkinson's 15 years ago, and then there was about a decade of silence, and then uh, really more recently, um, a lot of work in, in terms of trying to develop uh, this field further. Uh, by way of disclosures, uh, I have received uh, research support for the work that I'm doing. Um, I don't want to go through it all in detail, but just to say that there is uh, research support for this field. This is actually an area uh, that I think is uh, increasingly of interest to uh, research agencies, uh, particularly as people see that uh, the successes that we've had in cancer need to be translated to other parts of medicine, heart failure, kidney disease, and uh, neurologic illness. Uh, my objectives uh, for the talk are uh, threefold. Uh, one is for us to understand the unique challenges uh, that face people living with neurologic illness and their families. Uh, that, the Ill, that uh, these illnesses have challenges that are uh, quite different and distinct from people with cancer. Um, there are also internationally, um, you know, certainly in the United States, but in Australia and other where uh, gaps in care, uh, uh, gaps in neurologic care specifically that could benefit from a palliative care approach, uh, that neurology has not traditionally been linked to palliative care and palliative care physicians have not traditionally been very comfortable working with certain neurologic patients. Um, and lastly, we'll talk about some recent clinical trials and different models for how we can uh, more proactively meet the needs of people living with neurologic illness and their families. I think the takeaway message here is that there's no single right model uh, that's going to fit all illnesses, uh, that we're really going to have to be creative and that there's going to need to be ownership and champions on both the neurology side and on the palliative care side if we're really going to meet the needs of people with neurologic disease on a population level. Um, so, to, so to frame the, the issue a little bit further, um, I think we've all heard the term the silver tsunami, uh, which is this idea that our population in Australia and the world in general 
is uh, rapidly aging, and I would call neurologic illnesses the shark in the silver tsunami. Um, so the elderly population is growing faster than any other age group. So one in six people over age 65 uh, will be uh, in, in 2050. Uh, the two most common neurodegenerative illnesses uh, currently affect 11%, which is Alzheimer's disease, and 1% of people over age 65. And those numbers uh, nearly quadruple when you get to age 85. Uh, these are the only causes of death which are currently rising. Cancer is fairly stable, going down a little bit. Heart disease is going down a little bit. Uh, neurodegenerative illnesses are continuing to rise, and at least one in three elderly adults are expected to die with or of one of these illnesses. So it's uh, imperative, it's critical uh, that as a field and as individual healthcare practitioners that we get very comfortable with palliative care and palliative care conversations for people with neurologic illness. Uh, they are also the leading cause of nursing home placement hands down. Um, and again, as we're looking at how do we age successfully, I think a palliative care approach may improve our ability to age in place and age at home. Um, I also want to remind the audience that neurology is not just uh, a problem for older adults. Uh, neurologic illness is actually far and away the leading diagnosis in pediatric palliative care. Uh, we have a paper that's going to be coming out, and I believe it's almost 60% of the pediatric inpatient palliative care consultations were for a neurologic disease, far more common actually than cancer. Um, brain and spinal tumors are the second most common causes of cancer in children. Uh, traumatic brain injury and multiple sclerosis are leading causes of disability in young adults, um, can also be causes of death. And stroke is the fifth leading cause of death and the most common preventable cause of disability. Uh, I'm going to, in my talk, uh, stick mostly to Parkinson's disease, which I feel like is a very prototypical neurodegenerative illness. It involves motor symptoms, cognitive symptoms. And, um, and later in the talk, you'll hear about ALS, which I think is, uh, has some distinct features, but uh, most of what I'm talking about uh, would still apply. Um, if we're thinking about how do we define palliative care needs in Parkinson's disease, I think there are some things that are important to realize. We did a study uh, a few years ago uh, where we looked at palliative care needs in Parkinson's, and we found that across the board, even in beginning stages of Parkinson's disease, that palliative care needs were similar to patients with advanced cancer. Um, I thought we might have to do a subgroup analysis, but really from the get-go, um, and we'll talk about the qualitative side of this, that people with these illnesses have significant needs. Uh, both patients, and I think very significantly, care partners and families have needs. And this is something that may be a little bit different than cancer um, in terms of a lot of what I do in my outpatient clinic is care partner support. Um, these needs, importantly, they contribute to patients' quality of life, even when in control for motor severity and depression. Uh, one of the things that I try to do as a neurologist is to get the neurologic community to take ownership for this. Um, and if we're thinking about how do we motivate the neurology community, our goal is to improve quality of life. And I think a lot of people have the impression uh, that palliative care really isn't about quality of life until you're about to die. And what our uh, data shows is that these things, such as grief, such as spiritual well-being, such as non-motor symptoms like constipation and pain, contribute to quality of life throughout the, the total course of the illness. Um, the last thing which I think is very important is that patients have a very strong preference for proactive discussions. And when we explain to people what palliative care is, what the palliative care approach is, uh, people are like, sign me up today. Um, so I think we need to, as a community, think about how we want to talk to people about palliative care. Uh, there's certainly a number of studies uh, showing that calling it supportive care rather than palliative care may make it more palatable uh, to both clinicians and to patients. Uh, but the bottom line is, is that people really do want these kinds of services. Uh, regarding qualitative studies and really getting into the heart of what these unique needs are, um, one is, is that there are ongoing and progressive threats to personhood. Um, when people have cancer, um, oftentimes they can talk about cancer as if it was something foreign, something outside of them, even though it's inside of their body. When you're thinking about an illness like Parkinson's or like Alzheimer's disease, it's really an intrinsic threat to personhood. It is changing who you are as a person. And these struggles with identity, these struggles with roles, um, I think are very important and uh, dramatic um, um, causes of, of people's diminished quality of life. Um, and, and require not just the neurologist or the palliative medicine specialist, but the chaplain, the psychologist, the worker, who also develop skills of how do we work with people with neurologic illness. 
Um, there are social isolation and cosmetic effects. One of my favorite quotes from the study was uh, that she called her Parkinson's a flamboyant illness because her dyskinesias and her tremor, uh, when people have a walker, if people are drooling, uh, these are illnesses that call attention to themselves in a way that cancer typically does not, at least until the end stage of it. Um, there's also, you know, not people wearing uh, bracelets to um, show their pride for having a neurologic illness. There's still a lot of stigma around neurologic illnesses and social isolation uh, is a major issue. Um, invisible symptoms like fatigue, pain, and constipation tend to fall between the cracks. Um, and part of this is, is that neither the neurologist nor the primary care doctor are taking ownership for these symptoms. And the patient is oftentimes left in the middle and is confused about who should they bring these symptoms up with. Um, if you look at things like fatigue and pain, only about half the time do the doctors even recognize that those symptoms are present. Uh, people have a fear of death, but more pressing for a lot of people is a fear of dementia a fear that they're not going to recognize their loved one, a fear that they're going to die alone, drooling in the corner of a nursing home, uh, that people would rather die than go through that. And that's, again, one of these psychological challenges that we need to talk about. Uh, people have worries about the future, including financial. Um, and I'd love to see more financial guidance in the medical space. Um, ongoing grief, uh, particularly for partners and, and uh, family members. Uh, losing my husband one inch at a time from an illness like Alzheimer's disease is a common and a tragic story. And this kind of ongoing grief is predictive of complex and prolonged bereavement after people die. Um, so it's something that, again, we need to think about and we need to address early. And then, as I mentioned before, social isolation and loneliness is a big issue. And one of the things which I think is the most heartbreaking is that for a patient and their care partner, they can be spending uh, 24 hours together and they both feel lonely and they both feel disconnected uh, because their roles have changed so dramatically. Uh, regarding medical symptoms, I think it's important to point out that um, in neurology, we might deal with some of the same symptoms as we do in other aspects of palliative care, but the causes can be different. So pain and Parkinson's disease can be due to dystonia, can be due to medication side effects. There are unique symptoms that we see in neurology. For instance, patients with brain cancer have seizures, they have headaches, uh, they have changes in speech. Um, certain symptoms, like a bladder infection, can manifest with confusion or uh, unusual manifestations that we don't see in other medical illnesses. And then there's difficulties in communicating symptoms because of the nature of neurologic disorders. So a patient with dementia who is having pain may present as having agitation. Um, and so we really need to think uh, deeply about how we're doing symptom assessment and, and modify our scales that we're using for cancer. Uh, the prognoses in these illnesses are often different and, and, and can be difficult, um, much more so, I think, often than cancer. So after a subacute brain injury, like a stroke or a traumatic brain injury, uh, patients in the hospital uh, really don't know what the next few weeks or months are going to show. Uh, they don't know what they're going to look like six months or a year from now. Uh, multiple sclerosis inherently has uncertainty built into it because people can have a relapse or remission at any time. Uh, neurodegenerative illnesses do not follow straight lines. Uh, the rule is really that people will have plateaus and drops and acceleration, uh, making it very difficult for uh, doctors to plan for the future, but more so for patients and their families. Um, and lastly, we don't have great clinical decision aids currently. We don't have a great amount of data. Uh, for some things like uh, dementia and ALS, we do a fair job. In Parkinson's disease, uh, data is really totally lacking for how can we predict what the future is going to hold. Um, I want to um, let people in the audience know that psychiatric symptoms are really part and parcel of neurologic illnesses. Uh, if you look again at some Parkinson's disease, the rates of depression and anxiety are about 40 to 50 percent, so twice that of other chronic illnesses at the same level of disability. And part of that is because these brain illnesses affect parts of the brain that affect mood. Uh, they can manifest differently than in the general population. People often will have less uh, frank sadness or crying or guilt and may have more apathy or other uh, types of symptoms. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to tell if someone is depressed. So somebody with Parkinson's may have a masked face, they may be slow moving, and so they may be misdiagnosed as depression if they don't have it or it might be missed. And then apathy, the syndrome of loss of motivation, is important to recognize in part because it can actually be made worse by certain antidepressants. Uh, there are emotional, spiritual, and existential issues that I think are fairly unique and even when they're not unique, are oftentimes exaggerated in patients with neurologic illness. 
Um, again, this day-to-day, month-to-month, year-to-year uncertainty is huge. Um, ongoing and anticipatory grief, uh, the fear and the guilt of being a burden to one's family, something that we hear over and over again, even at the time of diagnosis, people are thinking about that. Um, social isolation. Uh, from a spiritual standpoint, uh, people will often feel that this illness was a punishment from God. Uh, people may have challenges in maintaining rituals and spiritual connection. Uh, again, a difference from cancer, uh, that because of speech or cognitive issues or gait issues, they're no longer able to be part of their religious community, or they may uh, need more creative uh, tools to get to be part of that community. Um, rates of demoralization in multiple illnesses like ALS and Parkinson's are higher than cancer. And I think part of that is that in a few degenerative illnesses, there is no hope uh, for a cure. And how do you maintain hope in the face of something that's incurable? It takes some more creativity. Uh, there are also physical and cognitive challenges to people's roles and identity. Uh, there are care partner challenges. Um, so cognitive, physical, and emotional disabilities, which often are concurrent, all contribute to care partner burden. And in fact, it's really the cognitive and the neuropsychiatric uh, symptoms, uh, such as agitation, that most often lead to nursing home placement and caregiver burnout. Um, impaired communication is something that we see um, and hear a lot from families. And in fact, families are often more bothered by the change in communication than is the patient. Um, care partners are often impacted in terms of sleep. Um, we are publishing, and Janice Miyazaki has published this, that there are double digit percentages of abuse from patients to care partners. And one of the things that's interesting about that is that things that you think might predict that, such as dementia, even gender, um, don't really hold up. So sometimes a male spouse uh, is being abused uh, physically and even sexually by their female partner and may not feel comfortable bringing it up. Um, people have their partner there physically, but they're also losing them in so many ways in this uh, um, Constant reminder of who this person was makes it hard to deal with that ongoing loss and grief. Uh, there's prolonged and unpredictable disease courses and then high rates of complex and complicated bereavement after death. Um, there are social challenges. Uh, people with MS and head injury uh, have disability as young adults and need guidance with that. Uh, memory care units for patients with Huntington's and young onset Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are difficult because they don't socially fit in. Um, and they may have even more difficulties adjustment uh, than older adults who are going to a nursing home. Uh, patients face huge difficulties in financing non-medical home care. Uh, actually, in an, an international perspective, I think it's better almost everywhere in the world than the United States. Um, in our last study where we were comparing caregivers uh, in the United States and Canada, at baseline, before we did any intervention, people were doing better in Canada. So socialized medicine, having access um, to systems that support care partners at home is, is critical. Um, there are financial concerns with loss of work, with caring for people at home, and then there's social stigma. Um, the last uh, couple of challenges I want to mention have to do with clinicians and healthcare providers. Uh, neurologists have the highest rate of burnout of any medical uh, subspecialty. Uh, and I think part of this is that we are, you know, in some ways uniquely unprepared to deal with the illnesses that we're seeing. Uh, that we get minimal training in important conversations, advanced care planning, end of life care. We know where these diseases are headed, uh, but we're feeling helpless and hopeless in front of them. And I'm hopeful that as palliative care becomes part and parcel of neurologic care, uh, that burnout will also uh, uh, be reduced. Uh, many neurologists avoid palliative care issues. Uh, some feel like they're already doing palliative care because they're dealing with an incurable illness, even though they're not really taking a palliative care approach. Um, so there's a huge amount of uh, barriers that we need to um, address to get neurologists up to speed. Um, similarly, with palliative medicine, uh, and there's been studies on this, that people have less comfort, less experience, and less training in neurologic illness. And there are not the same kind of efforts. If you go to a cancer center, you're going to have a palliative care person on that team. If you go to any center of excellence for Parkinson's or Alzheimer's around the world, it's going to be very rare that you find palliative care. Um, there's also a need to make an adaptation. Uh, a, a example that I, I think is very important is that Haldol, the medication that blocks dopamine and that will make Parkinson's worse, is standard in comfort kits for palliative for hospice, at least in the United States, for Parkinson's patients. So we really need to make accommodations for them. And then there are institutional barriers. Again, in the United States, hospice criteria 
really do not make sense for neurodegenerative illnesses. Uh, you need a six-month prognosis. People with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are routinely kicked off of hospice. Sometimes they have to make a decision between whether they want hospice or home physical therapy. Um, and so I think there's a huge amount of uh, room for um, advocacy for this area. So what, what are our gaps in care uh, currently? So this was a, a study that we did a few years ago. It was actually replicated in a larger data set of 20,000 people by Claire Kreutzel. Um, and what we found was that for inpatient palliative care consults, that 70% of people at the time of the consult could not communicate. Uh, the mean palliative performance score was 20, uh, which is very low, um, essentially bedbound. 50% uh, of people were receiving critical care at the time of the consult. 50%, and this was a rising trend, had chronic illnesses like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Um, and I think that what's important about that is that there were missed opportunities in the outpatient to even avoid this hospitalization at all. And in fact, myself and Janice have published uh, that our rates of people dying in the hospital are less than half that as people who don't get palliative care early. Uh, the last thing is that only 20 to 30% of patients had any advanced directives at the time of the consult, despite the fact that over half of them had illnesses that would be expected to progress. Um, worldwide, uh, there's low rates of hospice and palliative care use uh, for people with uh, neurologic illnesses. Uh, there's under recognition and treatment of non-motor symptoms. Uh, we are not systematically approaching and integrating psychosocial and spiritual issues into our care for these patients. Uh, there's institutional barriers, as I mentioned, and then there's noble gaps in training. So we have a lot of work to do um, as an international community. And this is what I would call kind of our current chronic care model. So we have a neurologist who is taking care of some of the motor and neurologic symptoms. We have a primary care doctor who might help with comorbid illnesses like hypertension. Uh, nobody is looking out for the care partner, and the patient and the care partner are kind of on their own when it comes to finding other resources. And what we have is our current state of affairs is that if somebody's seeing a neurologist, they have good motor symptom control, they have fair non-motor symptom control, and when it comes to advanced care planning, end-of-life care, caregiver support, psychosocial and spiritual needs, uh, we're really doing a fairly poor job overall. Um, before moving further, I also want to make sure that we're using the term palliative care in the same way. Um, so palliative care, I think a lot of times when people use that term, think about it as a specialty. And palliative care certainly is, and there's a role for specialty palliative care in neurology. Uh, but it's also an approach and philosophy of care. And this idea of primary palliative care, I think, is going to be hugely important in terms of providing adequate palliative care to this on a population level. Um, it's an important skill set, I think, for all members of the team. And it's also an important public health goal. So when you think about medicine's goals, that uh, having a, a death with dignity, with comfort, with uh, having care uh, throughout the course of incurable illnesses, that all of these things are important. And they're part of uh, what palliative care can provide so well. When we're thinking about uh, palliative care for neurologic illnesses, we really need to start thinking proactively. Um, in this uh, Calvin and Hobbes cartoon, uh, Calvin is asking Hobbes uh, about a, a paper that he's writing, and, and Hobbes says, I'm waiting for the right inspiration. Uh, what is that? Last minute panic. And I feel like that is our current approach to neuropalliative care, um, is that we're kind of waiting for the last minute. Uh, people are in the ICU, they're in the hospital, they're on death's door, and that's currently when most palliative care is starting for patients with neurologic disorders. Uh, what we found in our clinic is that if we can see those same patients and care partners years earlier, we may be able to prevent a care partner burnout. We may be able to prevent demoralization. And we certainly make it easier for that patient and their family to even thrive uh, despite having uh, a very significant illness. Uh, I, I believe this uh, slide uh, got turned around in the transfer to Australia. Uh, but if you can imagine it turned 90 degrees, uh, this is a, a graph of palliative care needs over time. And, and you can see that there's a spike at the time of diagnosis. And we know this from qualitative studies. There is a great study called um, uh, uh, um, Dropping the Bomb about the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Um, so right from the onset of these illnesses, there's high palliative care needs. And then over the course of it, people lose their ability to drive. They're losing communication. They're needing help with dressing. But those are all periods of time where, as a medical community, we can and should intervene with palliative care conversations and extra support. Um, and then certainly in the last phases of the illness, uh, there's a huge need for palliative care, but that's not the only time uh, that people need it. 
Um, Kirk Hall, who is a amazing patient advocate, um, came up with this concept of the three-legged stool for thinking about palliative care as a public health good. And so if we really want to support the Parkinson's community, we need palliative care specialists who know how to take care of people with Parkinson's. We need community and disease support organizations who can provide support groups and other resources and education. And we need primary care providers and non-palliative specialists like neurologists to understand the palliative care approach and to employ it uh, when it's necessary. Neural palliative care, uh, I think, is worth naming specifically. It's an emerging field that recognizes that people living with neurologic illnesses have unique palliative care needs. And I know there's some talk about integrated palliative care, but I actually like the term hybrid, uh, that it's really a combination of two or more distinct elements. And I think palliative care without a deep knowledge of neurology and neurology without a deep knowledge of palliative care is not going to be as effective as having a real hybrid field. And, and it depends where we're at in the illness. So early on, uh, when these illnesses are just starting, I think the burden is going to be on neurologists to incorporate more palliative care. And later on in the disease, the burden will be on palliative care specialists to bring in more neurology into their skill set. Um, so how do we improve uh, models of care? So there's kind of four basic models or four ways that we can think about this. Uh, there's a consultative model, which I think is probably the classic model that people think of, which is namely that we refer a patient to a palliative care team or a palliative care specialist. Primary palliative care is the idea that neurologists and others will integrate palliative care principles into the care they provide. Integrated specialty palliative care would be adding, say, a palliative care specialist to a Parkinson's team. And then neural palliative care is, is again, this hybrid vision where people who are neurologists may do a palliative care uh, fellowship so that they can provide all-in-one wraparound care. Um, all of these models have their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, the consultative model uh, depends on a palliative care workforce that can increase fragmentation in care. Primary palliative care cannot address the full spectrum of, of uh, palliative care needs. Integrated specialty palliative care is expensive. It takes up a lot of space. Neural palliative care, uh, I don't think there's any way we're going to meet the workforce demands for that. Uh, certainly not in the near future. And so I think we have to think about these as complementary puzzle pieces and that all of them are going to be necessary if we're really going to meet um, uh, the vast needs that we're facing. Uh, this was a paper that uh, was published uh, earlier this year uh, where we compared integrated outpatient palliative care with standard care in patients with Parkinson's. And I would really call this a neural palliative care approach, uh, a hybrid approach. So we did have palliative care specialists who work with our team but in general, they were helping us to uh, train the team to provide support and guidance, and that the neurologist was actually doing the vast bulk of what we would consider palliative care. Uh, in this paper, we changed that model. So if we think back to that model, of our chronic model, uh, this was the model that we used for this paper. And so, you know, we had the patient's neurologist who's still doing what they're good at. We have a primary care provider doing what they're good at. And then there's an interdisciplinary uh, palliative or neural palliative care team uh, that is specifically focused on looking at non-motor symptoms. In fact, we used the checklist to make sure that these did not fall between the cracks. Uh, we had a nurse on the team who was helping with uh, nutrition, home care, advanced care planning, a social worker, particularly helpful for care partner support and financial questions, a chaplain to help with spiritual well-being and grief counseling. And our hypothesis was that this model of care compared to our current standard model would result in better patient and family outcomes. And in fact, that is how it turned out. Um, so our primary outcome was quality of life. And as soon as three months after the start of the study, uh, quality of life was better in patients. And we believe that was largely driven uh, by better symptom management. And in fact, our largest effect size was uh, in terms of the ESAS, the Edmonton Symptom Assessment Scale. Um, care partner benefit was marginally significant at six months and was greatly significant at 12 months and probably would continue to increase. And uh, there were two interpretations of this. One was that care partners felt like they couldn't take care of themselves until they knew that their patient uh, was well cared for. The other is, is as a progressive illness, uh, that we had greater benefits as these disease progresses. And in a secondary analysis, we did find, not surprisingly, that the greater and the higher the palliative care need was, the greater the relative benefit of the palliative care team. Um, other study results that I'd like to highlight, uh, symptom management was better, grief was better. One of the things that was surprising to us was that motor symptoms were actually significantly better. 
And we think that part of that was is that people on the palliative care arm were more engaged with their life because we were having meaningful conversations about how to connect with joy and meaning to their life. Uh, and we consider that a kind of broadly goals of care and life care goals. In terms of qualitative results, people on the palliative care arm, they felt a sense of guidance. Uh, they felt support, they felt clarity, um, and they gave us feedback that difficult conversations led to improved engagement uh, with their life and did not destroy hope. Um, I think at least neurologists have some fear that by bringing up advanced care planning, by bringing up prognosis, uh, that they may destroy hope for patients. And in fact, our uh, uh, objective results and qualitative results showed the exact opposite was the case, uh, that people actually had more fear and more confusion when they were dealing with the unknown and that when they had open and honest conversations about their illness, that they felt much more cared for and much more secure. Um, I'd also like to mention that there is good evidence, and, and these are uh, three uh, excellent papers that are out there. Uh, the first one uh, was uh, based in Italy, uh, also involved David Oliver from the United Kingdom. Uh, that was a basically a consultative specialist palliative care model for patients with MS, uh, Parkinson's, and other neurodegenerative illnesses. Uh, that showed benefits to both patients and care partners. Um, Irene Higginson, who's done a lot of great work, uh, had a short-term palliative care model, again, a consultative model, uh, that showed benefits to patients, to care partners, and I think very importantly, uh, to reducing the cost of care. Um, and then the last paper, which came from Barbara Vickery, uh, was a, a, a very different model where there is a care manager, so kind of adding a unique role on the team for patients with dementia, and that care uh, manager helped coordinate care and again, improved outcomes. So there's a lot of different ways that we can improve outcomes for patients with neurologic illness. Uh, part of this will be contextual. I'm actually looking forward to the international conversation and talking to you in Australia uh, because every healthcare system I think has their own limitations but also their own opportunities. Um, as we are moving uh, forward, we're looking at different ways of implementing uh, this care. And so we're looking at not just implementing it at academic centers and centers of excellence, but how do we do this in the community? Uh, we're about four and a half years into a study uh, where we are using a combination of primary palliative care training for neurologists and telehealth uh, to help people who are community neurologists to provide better palliative care for their patients. And when we interviewed uh, community neurologists, the two biggest gaps that they mentioned to us was that uh, I never got palliative care training in my residency and that you know we're, we're dealing with people in very rural parts of the United States and Wyoming and, and the Western slopes of Colorado, uh, that if I'm a, a practitioner in that setting, I don't have a chaplain or a social worker. And so using telemedicine to provide team-based care even into uh, places that are hard to reach, um, I can tell you that we don't have our final results, but our preliminary results are very promising, both in terms of qualitative comments we've gotten from clinicians qualitative data that we've gotten from patients and families, and our preliminary results actually show that this model also produced the benefit and quality of life compared to standard care. <clears throat> um, the last study and the newest study, which we are just getting off the ground and actually will involve colleagues in Australia, is another uh, patient centered Outcomes Research Institute project uh, that's looking over the next three years to make palliative care a new standard throughout the Parkinson's Foundation Center of Excellence Network. So this is uh, 49 centers across the world that see 200,000 patients with Parkinson's. Um, in order to do so, we have operationalized palliative care around five pillars that we felt were measurable and doable. Uh, those are that we want um, all of these centers to routinely screen for and manage non-motor symptoms, uh, to routinely screen for care partner needs and provide support, um, psychosocial issues like grief, to do annual advanced care planning, and to have uh, uh, systems in place for appropriate referrals to palliative care specialists, including for end of life care and hospice. Um, so that is our goal. And that is actually at the end of three years, if we're successful, one of the ways that centers of excellence are gonna be measured and what their funding is gonna depend on is on doing good palliative care. Um, so it's a very exciting study. I, I think it can really move the needle in the field of neurology because these are centers uh, that people look for, for inspiration. And it's where a lot of people train. Um, when we're thinking about this, uh, community and advocacy groups are essential. And I also think uh, a key principle here is going to be grassroots demand from patients. And so one of the things that we're doing, in addition to educating clinicians, is educating patients and care partners to come in with their own checklist and to demand this care. 
Uh, one of the things that we found in our community study is that often neurologists will not bring up advanced care planning, but if a patient will bring up advanced care planning, then they can respond to it. And that's actually been inspired by uh, Randy Curtis, who's done some interesting work with advanced care planning and training primary care providers to do a better job of that. Uh, so in summary, uh, neuropalliative care is an emerging field that aims to improve the quality of life of people living with neurologic illness. Uh, that palliative care needs are important and major drivers of quality of life throughout the course of these illnesses, and they're poorly met under current models of care. Uh, neurologists can improve outcomes for their patients through palliative care communication tools and other skills. Um, neuropalliative care, I think for everybody in the field, palliative care specialists, social worker, chaplains, nurses, uh, will enhance uh, career satisfaction, that uh, neurologic illnesses are going to be an increasing part of your life and help you engage your value as a healthcare provider. Um, and to practice neuropalliative care, we have to practice neuropalliative care. And so we really need to think about how are we gonna put these things into action. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Benzi. That was um, fantastic uh, and really appreciate the effort that went into that and keeping to time. Um, uh, Benzi um, uh, was charged with the responsibility of explaining neuropalliative care and the state of science of neuropalliative care and also uh, um, international perspectives as well and a bit of a focus, focus on Parkinson's disease. So to do that and keep the time in 30 minutes is a, an admirable uh, effort to say the least. So thank you very much indeed, Lindsay. We are greatly appreciative. Uh, a reminder too that there, you know, we would like your questions. So the, I believe you do have access to, there's a, you should see an ask a question icon tab um, available to you. So I think you can do that discreetly. I don't think everybody sees that um, question. So please don't hold back. And um, as I said, it's a great opportunity to hear from two experts in this area. So I would encourage you to submit those questions as we go. Our next speaker is Dr. Susan Mathers. Susan leads a specialist statewide neurological service at Calvary Healthcare Bethlehem here in Melbourne. Uh, the service office multidisciplinary care for people with a progressive neurological disease living in Victoria and bordering states. Her team has a track record in the successful administration of a number of clinical trials. Susan is a member of the Scientific Committee of Motor Neurone Disease Research Australia and a founding member of the Australian MND Registry and Victorian MND Research Tissue Bank. And um, Susan is going to provide, she's got a shorter amount of time uh, for her presentation. We were discussing before we kicked off today, but that can actually sometimes be even more difficult, uh, but it's going to provide a more local perspective, an Australian perspective, and a bit more of a focus on uh, motor neuron disease or ALS as it's um, often called internationally. Uh, so welcome very much, Susan. I'll hand over to you now. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Peter, uh, for asking me to talk today, and uh, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to have this uh, mixed, very wide and mixed audience. Um, I'm going to try and give light, and I'll touch very lightly on the Australian perspective of neuropalliative care, and particularly concentrate on motor neuron disease. I um, I have no uh, conflicts of interest. When I thought about what I might talk about today, I reflected on my own experience as a newly minted neurologist some 30 years ago coming to work uh, here at Bethlehem Hospital, which was then an inpatient chronic care service for people with neurological disability, particularly people with chronic MS. Um, what did I learn? I, I very quickly learned um, how to better communicate with people and to handle people with profound neurological disability. And I learned that from watching um, my more experienced colleagues, the nurses and allied health staff that were working at Bethlehem at the time. The other thing that was soon evident was that meeting people coming into hospital, often in extremis uh, or nearing the end of life, meeting them at that time with their family was not the right time to start uh, conversations about goals of care. And that led our team very quickly to establishing an outpatient service where we could meet people much, much earlier and have that diverse multidisciplinary input that Benzie's talked about. Um, the 
and, and, and as time went by, we had to really uh, address the outreach activities that were necessary to, to look after this group of patients because uh, traveling for care is, is not much fun and, uh, and I strongly endorse the need for, for good telehealth um, and we'll come back to that later. And lastly, uh, it was obvious that these people who were bouncing into hospital and often unable to be discharged back home again or even to a care facility needed much, much more than just a model of health care. And they needed all these other things addressed, the disability needs, their psychosocial needs and those of their family that Benzie's alluded to. So I've seen my career at Bethlehem really as a very long apprenticeship that, that I think is continuing and I think that we all need to join. So today I, I wanted to touch briefly on what I've called a community of practice. I want us all so to think about um, caring for people with these conditions and finding cures for these conditions as a continuum and, and a continuum that we can all contribute to. Um, and that will require a much more collective approach. And it's only by taking these steps uh, one at a time that we can build the evidence for policy reform um, and systemic change that, uh, that we might get from government. So what have other people said in Australia about the need for neurologists and palliative care services to work more closely together? Um, Palliative Care Australia and the Neurological Alliance of Australia, the two peak bodies, a few years ago went to Parliament House in Canberra to launch a joint statement on, on this topic and, and I was there that day. Amongst other things, they called for a palliative uh, care model that ensured a early referral, uh, education and the support and coordination we've been talking about. They also called for education neurologists and other health professionals about the benefits of palliative care uh, to their patients. Uh, and they might have added the, the need uh, for all of us to have some palliative care skills. But they also recognized that people with, uh, from palliative care services were not familiar with these patient groups and the, how to manage these conditions and that they too would need education and peer support. So what do I mean by community of practice? Um, these are a, a group of people or groups of people who share a common interest or common passion in their work. And they do that work better and better by interacting on a regular basis and learning from one another. And so all these things in the joint statement have called for us to share knowledge and, and share our skills. But knowledge is, is I think, a, quite a complicated thing. And if we think about it, there's knowing what you need to know or understand, understanding what you don't know. So the facts, and they're probably the simplest part of knowledge to get a grip of and to share. They can be written down, we can find them in books, we can look up the internet. There's knowing why. Why, why do diseases unfold as they do? Uh, what's the evidence for the treatments and management strategies that we offer to our patients? And that's about bringing science into our practice and using a more research methodology about how we improve the care uh, that we offer to patients and their families. Knowing who, knowing who to call, uh, there's nothing that can help you manage a tricky problem with a patient faster than picking up the phone and talking to somebody that you think uh, might know the answer to this or may have met this problem before. And it's something that I do all the time. And none of us uh, should be um, uh, embarrassed by showing our, our ignorance. Uh, all of these things... Um, I suppose in terms of knowing who to call it, it does raise this issue of networks. Uh, it's Im important uh, for us all to have our own professional network, but it's also important to recognize that people with neurological disease often have multiple agencies and, and people involved in their care, both formal and informal. Do we really know who the network is around this, this patient? And, and can we really call it a network? Because have we defined the way we're gonna communicate? Um, uh, have we delegated responsibilities across that network in, in care? I think often we haven't done that in a, in a formal way. Does the patient even know who to call um, and how we all communicate amongst ourselves? 
all of that um, is quite difficult to put into place but I don't think that these problems of sharing knowledge are insurmountable if we think about it but the last thing um, tacit knowledge I think is where we often uh, fall down and, and I have to reflect here that that you know I work in a, a hospital where palliative care service sits beside a neurological service. We have neuropalliative uh, clinicians working across the field. We share a health record. Uh, we can walk down the corridor and talk to one another and we, are, we can all attend the same education sessions. But we don't always get, uh, get it right either when we work together to care for these sorts of patients in the community. So what is it about um, our knowledge sharing that, we, that we're not doing well? And I think it does come down to tacit knowledge. Tacit knowledge is what we gather over time with experience. Um, it's the know-how. It's something that's actually quite hard to put into words and to write down. It's what people um, develop as they watch others do things well. It's, it's what we um, take from others. It's, it's imitating things that we see uh, is good practice uh, and it becomes intuitive over time. And I think that, uh, that this is an area that we all need to give some consideration to because we don't uh, share this kind of knowledge by just um, sending an email or sending a, cop a copy of a letter to another health professional. We can only really share this knowledge by working together, by actually being face to face in front of patients, uh, perhaps by doing shared telehealth sessions uh, and, and shared education. And I, and I very much um, endorse uh, what Benzie was talking about, the use of telehealth to bring our services together to actually work in front of patients and learn from one another and learn from the patient often as well. And so we're doing a project at the moment that's funded by the Victorian State Government uh, of what we've called My Neuropalliative Care. And it is about understanding you know, what is it that we're not doing so well and how can we improve the way we as a neurology service work with metropolitan and regional palliative care services who have the advantage of being able to visit people in their homes when they obviously can't come and see us. I want to look now at this care and cure continuum. Um, Professor Samari Un, these are two of her publications. She's been a, a strong advocate over many years now for a palliative approach to the care for people with motor neuron disease, right from diagnosis and all the way through to supporting their families in bereavement. And she talks about this until there is a cure, there is care. Um, I suppose what I want us to, to think about is as clinicians that whilst we provide good care to our patients, we should also be facilitating their ability to participate in research and in clinical trials. Um, and I say that because when you meet these patients, particularly for the first time, uh, many of them are not particularly focused on the care that we are offering. They're not um, very keen on um, engaging with uh, walking aids, wheelchairs, um, thinking about having a feeding tube inserted. Uh, and many of them want to talk about what they've been reading about on the internet and, and what kind of, of treatments we might be able to offer. Um, so we did a, a survey a few years back about what was important for the quality of people's care if they had a progressive neurological illness and 660 people from Victoria replied to that and as you can see the sorts of things you might expect they wanted us to communicate better they wanted access to specialist care so that they were talking to people who understood their diseases but they did want the care to be delivered at home or close to home and not have to travel for it and 70% wanted to be linked to research and if you look at the, the number of people with MND in that cohort, it was over 80% of people wanted their care to be linked to research. And I think we, we have a, a need to respond to that. And it's not to say that, uh, that, that that's pie in the sky uh, to think that we'll find better treatments for these diseases. Uh, 
Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, motor neuron disease, Huntington's disease are all going through a surge of uh, more uh, discovery research and clinical trials. And here we have a, a couple of papers that showing a significant promise that we might be able to start getting a handle on how to uh, improve survival in these diseases. So what is happening in Australia to, to try and bring the research community, the clinical care community and patients and families to work together in this area? And I'm going to confine my, my, my uh, comments to mainly motor neuron disease at this point. Over the last several years, a, a number of uh, MND clinics have developed first of all in the, uh, the eastern seaboard of Australia, in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne. Some of them growing out of uh, research sites, some like ours growing out of a clinical site that then took on more research. And over recent years, uh, South Australia, Perth and this year Tasmania have come on board. And we have a current NHMRC partnership project grant uh, to try and bring this uh, together. So this is themed around big data. Um, it's about bringing together all the clinical information of, for, of people living in Australia with MND, their genomic information, the proteomics, the skin biopsies, the tissue banking, all these, these things, bringing that together in a format that we can collaborate with sites that are doing similar work overseas. Because in a rare illness like motor neuron disease, that's quite heterogeneous and where we don't understand the mechanisms, um, then we're going to need hundreds of thousands of, of, of people to contribute uh, to the big data to find the answers to those research questions. But it's important that people who contribute in that way get something out of it as well. And this framework uh, and research collaboration platform will have a portal that patients can access quality information about their disease and about research activities that are going on and will have uh, input into improving the quality of their care. It also uh, allows us to hang off this framework a lot of psychosocial research and qualitative research on a national basis because, uh, for instance, I'm doing a project looking at, at health literacy in people with motor neuron disease at the moment and we can, we can garner support from anyone living anywhere in Australia to answer uh, those questions. The aim of these partnership grants is ultimately to inform government policy around how we deliver care and how we support research into these diseases. And just to make sure that we're not um, developing new silos that are ignoring work that's being done in, in other areas of Australia, um, just two weeks ago, uh, supported by a team at PricewaterhouseCoopers, we actually had a, an MND summit where we brought together people uh, with the disease and their families, clinicians, researchers, uh, funders of research, uh, to, to look at the, the, the bigger questions and how we might uh, advance this over the next few years. And so the aim was to have a statement about our shared purpose and how we might action, uh, not, not just improving research into MND, but improving care as well. And I want to just finish by uh, reminding people about uh, the, imp the importance of all that we, we can contribute as individuals. I hope I've, I've uh, incited some interest in these, uh, these patient groups. They're, they're wonderful patients to, to manage. It's not at all a depressing area to work in. They generate significant hope within themselves and their families and are an inspiration. Um, it is important, however, that uh, we as clinicians carve out some time or are allowed to have some time to think about how we might do our work better because as the King's Fund in the UK have pointed out, urgent will always drive out important and reforms don't occur by just working harder. 
and I'd like to just acknowledge the patient families and team members who contributed to the development of our, our models of care at Bethlehem, my co-investigators there and the MindOS partners. So I might just finish there, Peter. Thanks very much, Susan. That was fantastic. Much appreciated. And thanks again, too, for, for sticking to time, a difficult task with so much uh, information to uh, to convey. So it's greatly appreciated. But that's all good because it does leave us time, um, sufficient time, I hope, for comments and questions. So uh, just a reminder, we've actually got, uh, this is, is not only going for 60 minutes, we've allocated 75 minutes. So we're going to 15 minutes past the hour. So um, encourage people to um, uh, to still put in some questions. We've got quite a few already. So I might begin that process of conveying those. So um, a question from Becky um, who asks, have you found CBD oil or photobiomodulation to be helpful in the management of PD and PSP, PSP standing for PROG supranuclear palsy? Um, and I'm guessing um, that both our presenters would be equally able to uh, answer this, but I might just uh, see who wants to have a go first. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to, to start. Uh, in Colorado, I don't know if in Australia it's the same way, but in the United States, Colorado has a reputation as, as being the cannabis capital of America. Um, and, and so it was uh, pretty, pretty freely easy available the, the data behind uh, marijuana for Parkinson's is fairly weak, and, and for PSP, even even more non-existent. Um, so, so what I'm saying is, is more from personal experience. That there's been now, I think, four randomized controlled trials of uh, different uh, CBD combination THC products and Parkinson's, uh, all of which were, I would say, really more inconclusive than negative. Um, in, in my experience, uh, that, that you know, CBD oil may be helpful sometimes for anxiety, for sleep, uh, in combination with THC, maybe help with um, uh, pain, and particularly the creams I, I found helpful for neuropathic pain. Um, but I'm, I'm not aware of any specific evidence of, of them being usually helpful for either condition or for slowing progression. Although there there is animal data that's promising, uh, none of that's been translated into people, to my knowledge. Yes, I, I think my experience of using these things, uh, we don't prescribe them per se here in Victoria. Um, mo most patients who try ca cannabinoids uh, for, for their motor neuron disease, for instance, uh, do it off their own bat. Um, I think anecdotally they do uh, sometimes find it useful, particularly at night, to settle down for circulations and anxiety for, for sleep. There has been some confusion about whether um, cannabinoids are neuroprotective and therefore helpful uh, in the actual uh, treatment of, of the underlying disease, but there isn't as yet any evidence of that. Thank you very much uh, to both of you for those responses. Thanks, Becky, for that uh, question. Hopefully that's been helpful. And then a question from Georgia who asks, how do you see community healthcare services and allied health supporting neuropalliative care, especially in rural areas. So again, uh, both uh, of you are welcome to um, to offer responses. Yeah. If you're I'm I'm happy to have a go at that one first. Uh, I think they they play a very important role. Um, People who come to our clinics, for instance, are clearly not going to come on a, a regular weekly basis for physiotherapy uh, treatments and, and care. And our model is much more to work with the local team um, and support them if, uh, if they need uh, any education or equipment support uh, to deliver that care locally. And, and that, that can work very well if you can establish a, a, a two-way flow of information. I could um, add, add to that. Um, yeah, I, I think that allied health professionals are, are really critical. Um, you know, again, if we're thinking about palliative care in, in the broadest sense, uh, you know, that we need social work support, we need psychological support. Um, so, and in addition to, I think, providing these direct services, 
um, at least in my experience, uh, is that allied health professionals often are the people who are pushing for getting palliative care involved, sometimes more so than the neurologist. Uh, so I think having everybody on the team who is uh, aware of what palliative care can offer can be can be very helpful. I, I'd actually be interested to hear uh, Susan and Peter's experience. Um, in the U.S., uh, there's definitely a, a culture where neurologists, oncologists, and others, you know, seem to be somewhat threatened by palliative care and, and feel like as a physician that they should be able to provide everything and feel like palliative care is nosing into their business or, or that the neurologist says that you're not ready for palliative care yet, uh, kind of sticking to a old older notion of what palliative care is and, and when it can provide help. And so I think having a whole team involved with their eyes open uh, can be helpful for kind of moving the needle and advocating for, for patients. Yeah. I mean, I think when one of the things that um, we have noticed when we work with local allied health teams is that it's often about having that conversation about what is a palliative approach versus what is a rehabilitation approach. And, and I think there are you know, strong elements of rehabilitation that are helpful in managing these diseases, um, but it's you probably need a neuropalliative rehabilitation approach. And, and sometimes the local physiotherapist may in fact be concentrating perhaps too much on exercise and less on pain management or stretching or looking after range of movement and joints. And that's why some dialogue between our service and the local service can, can sort of get us all on the same page and, and can be very helpful. Um, experience of working with neurologists, I, I, I would agree. I think neurologists here in Australia are, are still not very comfortable in the palliative realm, whether it's in the acute hospital setting, looking after patients dying of stroke, for instance, acute stroke, or managing people with MND. They, uh, and it's one of the things I suppose that's driven our outpatient service that people are, are usually quite happy to refer on after diagnosis for the multidisciplinary care that, that, that we can provide. Um, but that doesn't help the patients who've got the much slower diseases like Parkinson's disease and muscular dystrophies who are going to be under the care of their neurologists for decades before um, they might hit some trigger or other that we don't necessarily have at the moment for a referral to palliative care. So I think what we see here in Australia is, is late referral generally, other than in motor neuron disease. Um, and and um, But also a reluctance by some palliative care services to take people on long term as well. So it's that's the area where we need to have some conversation. Thanks very much for those responses and to Georgia for that question. And a question from Laura. What has been your experience with having a speech pathologist in the neuropalliative care model, specifically in PD, but also any reflections on more generally in other uh, neuropalliative care conditions? And again, to either of you, this is not directed at um, uh, one person in particular, so please either of you feel free to respond. I'll let, I'll let Benji talk about PD first. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, uh, this is actually, I think one of the areas, uh, well, I mean, there's a lot of areas where I think we can learn from each other internationally and, and across centers. Um, there are, even within the United States, there are some centers that include a speech pathologist on the neuropalliative care team and others that don't. Um, and and it, it could work either way. Um, and at our center, we don't have a speech pathologist who's specifically on our team, but we definitely refer a lot to speech pathology and work with them. Um, in the ALS community, uh, speech pathology is often on the interdisciplinary team, and I think there's a role there. Uh, again, be interesting to hear about Susan's experience that the speech pathologist, you know, can often I think benefit from having a palliative care framework. Um, at, at Colorado, when I first started working with ALS, that the decision around uh, peg tube placement was often made on the basis of a, the speech pathologist or the nutritionist advice without any discussion of goals of care. And, and so it was really more of a kind of a medical and a symptom driven framework rather than a palliative and a person centered framework. Um, and so I think, you know, I think the bigger question is not whether they're, you know, on the team in the same room or not, but are, are people working within the same framework and, and using the same language and working together or not? Mm, sure, I, I I agree that, that 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 is important and you see that play out a lot in the acute hospital setting where the speech pathologist is often the person who makes someone nil by mouth 
chop, <laughs> full stop. And and then everyone runs around wondering how to manage that. And the usual medical response is obviously to put a tube down um, without any of that discussion happening about the longer term when it's a progressive neurological illness, not a reversible condition. Um, and, and I've certainly known a number of speech pathologists in those settings who are very uncomfortable about even advising on at-risk feeding, the sorts of things that we might embrace much more in a, with a palliative approach. In terms of working within a team like ours, it's dealing only with people with progressive neurological disease. I, I couldn't live without speech pathology. Um, it was a very strong feature of the team I first joined 30 years ago uh, and drove um, the, the the improvements in communication and the use of technology for communication and has driven our management of secretions uh, and feeding um, when patients want to continue some oral intake. Uh, I think they're a vital part, but they, but they do need to be embedded within that palliative approach, I agree. Thank you very much. I'm going to, uh, so thanks Laura for that question. We've got quite a number of questions coming through. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to get to all of them, so my sincere apologies. Um, I've got a question here related to uh, voluntary assistance Die and the question um, uh, from Amber about whether um, either of you believe it's going to be more accessible for people with neurological diseases, especially Parkinson's and dementia. Um, and uh, she comments that she's aware of um, a number of patients that she's been involved with who, who have this uh, request. So I don't want to go down a, a whole kind of uh, deep uh, and comprehensive discussion about the ethics of VAD, but just in the context of neuropalliative care, any perceptions about that, um, uh, her question about, do you think it's gonna become more available? Um, I mean, I suppose what I would say, uh, sort of quite apart from what anyone might might think about uh, the legality of, of assisted dying, as it is now in, in, in Victoria, I think one of the problems with our, our model in Victoria is that it's unfair, that it allows access to voluntary assisted dying to uh, a number of people with these sorts of conditions uh, as long as they are competent and, and getting close to the end of life. Uh, but it completely ignores the the very legitimate fears that, that most people have about losing capacity and losing cognitive function um, is probably the thing that would frighten most of us and, and, and make us want to explore that sort of option if it was available and yet it completely ignores that whole group of people and I, I just think when you make laws in your country there should be a degree of, of equality uh, as the basis of, of those laws. Now, I, I don't know what the answer to that is, and, I, and we all have our own views about whether this is a path that we should be going down or not. Um, but I'd be interested to hear what, what Peter and Benzi think. In the U.S., uh, there definitely is movement of that. Uh, Maine actually was the latest state to add um, medical aid and dying laws. Um, proportionately, ALS is the highest proportion of patients, uh, more so than cancer, who re request medical aid in dying, at least in the United States. Um, in, in some parts of the world, um, I think Belgium, um, it, it, medical aid in dying is actually one of the leading causes of death uh, for people with certain neurologic illnesses. So, so it, it's kind of varying. And, you know, Canada um, also, I think, is becoming you know an increasingly used option, and it, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, you know, the palliative care community internationally. Um, you know, has been split as to whether or not to support uh, medical aid in dying with, uh, you know, I think some of the fears of the palliative care community being is that uh, making access to medical aid in dying too easy, you know, could undercut, um, uh, you know, support for palliative care and access to palliative care services. Uh, I was just actually interviewing uh, somebody who's doing a piece on the laws in Maine, and I think there was also another article about this, uh, but at least in the United States, there is currently no requirement for a palliative care specialist to be involved in these discussions. And, and so I think there, there are some safeguards that could be built in there. Um, and then the question about uh, dimension capacity, I mean, that, that could be a whole lecture in and of itself. 
Um, I, I've certainly seen patients in Colorado where it was legal. Uh, there were some patients who just skirted by uh, with having capacity. Uh, there were some patients who I think maybe would have made a different decision for their future self than their future self would want. Uh, but there certainly were patients who I think, uh, had the laws been written differently, would have absolutely chosen um, to, to use it. And so in some ways, it is a civil rights issue, uh, but it's a, it's a very thorny one. Mm-hmm. I think we might have lost Peter. <laughs> Peter disappeared. Uh, we're still broadcasting live. I can I can read a question. Um, let's uh, kind of work our way um, uh, down here. Um, so I'll, I'll just pick one. So from Kylie, uh, do you think funding to community palliative care needs to increase in order to be able to provide care to those living with progressive neurologic disease? Uh, so since I asked the question, I'll let uh, Susan go first. I'm sorry, I can't see. Can you just say that again? Yeah. Do, do you think funding to community palliative care needs to increase in order to be able to provide care to those living with progressive neurologic disease for a longer period of time? Um, well, I, I suppose it depends where palliative care sees its, itself in the future. And with all of the chronic diseases that they might be managing for a long period of time, that's to be that needs to be addressed if resources can't stretch that far. Um, I would certainly welcome their their earlier and ongoing involvement because I think um, there is a danger when people get discharged from palliative care services that it takes too long to get back into the system when things start to go wrong and things can go wrong over just a few hours in this this patient group. Um, the other thing that where funding comes comes into play is when people are being either cared for at home or particularly cared for in a hospital setting or a nursing home setting where their care needs are clearly much, much higher than your average person with another illness or someone coming in with dementia, say, on its own. Um, and, and, and clearly it's very, very difficult to look after the these people in in hospital compared to the round the clock care that they get at home from family and 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 people always struggle when they come into hospital it doesn't matter which hospital i think they go into in victoria there is a a, a small benefit there that the government funds a little bit of extra money that can go to a palliative care service that admits a patient with motor neuron disease just acknowledging that they might need to employ some extra staff to to help care for them but that but by no means does that address all of the needs yeah, I'd, be, I'd be curious to know more about in Australia. So in, in the United States, uh, which is kind of a schizophrenic healthcare system, um, it, it, it kind of depends on, on where you are. So as, as an example, in accountable care organizations or health maintenance organizations where all of the person's costs are covered by the same uh, entity, uh, palliative care approaches actually save money. And so, uh, you know, so, so if you have a single payer who's looking at everything, um, it's less of a problem, but in other parts, in fact, the vast majority of the United States, you know, a particular hospital is making money fee for service when somebody goes to the ICU and they lose money uh, for, for palliative care. So, so in some case, you know, I think it kind of depends on who's paying the cost. Um, you know, I, I don't believe, I, I think that there are ways that we can provide care that's efficient and effective without uh, bankrupting healthcare systems and that palliative care, you know, will actually save money, but but I think it's getting people to be kind of dollar wise and and, and not, you know, kind of counting all, all the pennies and, and looking more uh, at the big picture. Hmm. And then it comes into, you know, it's, it's, we're really talking about clinical research to, uh, to, to, to build the evidence base for the, for the kinds of practices that we're wanting to support. Hi, Peter. <laughs> Hi, I'm sorry, I've, um, uh, my computer decided to do something else for a couple of minutes, um, but I've joined back on in time, but unfortunately the, the time has um, gone rather swiftly. We do need to bring the discussion to a close, um, but can I just say thank you very much uh, for those people who took time in the day to be part of the webinar. Um, we really do appreciate it. And, um, 
this will be available on our website within a few days on our Centre for Palliative Care YouTube channel. So if you weren't able to see all of it or if you want to make others aware of it, then please you'll be able to direct them to that um, particular opportunity. I would um, also like to thank uh, the people at the Centre for Palliative Care behind the scenes who organised this. Um, there's quite a bit of it goes into these types of things. So thank you very much to the administrative team at the Centre for Palliative Care. And, and finally, a big thank you to Benzie and to Susan. Um, you know, we're very fortunate in Australia. Susan has been a real trailblazer um, in neuropalliative care for, you know, she mentioned she started in this area three decades ago. And it's certainly um, I've been mindful of her work and her impact over a long period of time. And uh, we're very fortunate to have her. And uh, it's been great to have the opportunity for her to share some experience and some knowledge um, uh, today. So thank you very much, Susan. And to Benzie, um, who's, um, it's a different time in, in uh, New York at the moment. So thanks for staying a bit later. Um, and uh, he is also a trailblazer in the US, really taking off on a, a number of fronts um, and enhancing the, um, the well-being of numerous uh, patients and families who are affected by, by neurological illness. So we've been, I think, very, um, very fortunate to have two such great presenters. So thank you, everybody. Uh, much appreciated and enjoy your rest of your day. Thank you very much indeed. Bye for now.